ahead and turn it on there. Psalm 69, we're going to begin in verse number 19 in just a few minutes, uh, but we're going to look at verse 20 as the key verse that we're going to begin with this evening. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day as I was studying the scripture over and, and found the uh, key verse to the chapter and uh, talking about a broken heart or uh, someone who has a heavy heart. You might ever have a heavy heart. I'm not talking about a physical problem, but a heavy heart. I mean, maybe some problem or some difficulty or some situation uh, that was faced in your life, and you just, I mean, you just felt like, man, this, this, is, this is beyond my ability to deal with it. And uh, actually, through the Messianic Psalm here we have tonight, uh, we, we, we learn how to deal with uh, those times when we have a heavy heart or a breaking heart. You know, uh, we, we just, some kind of situation comes into our life, and it, it literally almost breaks us. And uh, literally, they're finding out uh, many heart attacks are, br are brought on through that. And I'm going to share some medical things with you tonight in regards to the Lord as well as what they're finding out about people who are carrying uh, stressful lives. They say, and you know this, stress is one of the hardest things on the heart and all the problems it's causing. And so I want to share some of these things with you tonight. But look at verse number 20 as we begin this evening. It says, Reproach hath broken my heart. And I am full of heaviness, and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. And then verse 21 goes along with that, talking about the, the fact of the Lord. This is picturing our Lord in this Messianic uh, portion of this scripture. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Uh, we all can find encouragement from the Word of God when we get into situations that are just beyond our, our ability. And you remember as the Lord was hanging there on the cross, He says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And sometimes we feel forsaken. We feel like our load is so heavy and we, we wonder where the Lord is. Well, He's right there. And he's going to help us. And as I was thinking about that, uh, I want you to turn over to Luke before I have a word of prayer. Keep your place there in uh, chapter 69. Look at Luke chapter 4, if you would, please. And down at verse number 16. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And uh, here God's Word informs us that Jesus came to uh, heal the brokenhearted. And uh, so since he makes a statement about uh, healing the brokenhearted, now listen to me very carefully. Whenever you find a statement in the Bible about something, you know what's going to happen to somebody. And it could happen to you. And so here in verse 16 we see the picture. It says, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, in other words, Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Jesus came not only to save people, but he also came to deal with the heavy burdens and the stress and the problems that you and I face on a daily basis. Nobody understands about a broken heart like the Lord does. And as we get into the scripture tonight, you're going to see that to be true because I'm going to point out several scriptures that might help us along that line. So the question I give you tonight those that are here in this auditorium, as well as those who are watching by means of the internet, is there a load on your life tonight? Is there problems and difficulties and situations that seems to be bearing down on life? Is the stress at your job or stress of a situation that you're being confronted with literally just uh, being so heavy upon your life? Well, we have some help here. And I hope it will be a blessing to your life. And before we get into it, I want you to bow your heads with me and let's have a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you always give us solutions to the things that we're confronted with in this life. And we're thankful that you say right in this scripture here in Luke that you came to heal the brokenhearted because you knew that we're going to be faced with situations that we can't deal with. We're put in under pressures that just beyond our ability in our physical realm and as well as our emotions to deal with it. But we're glad that you're right there. You're there to help us. 
And I pray the scriptures that we study tonight and the things that we look at will benefit every person that's here this evening. We love you. We thank you for your word that has the solutions for our lives. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you would, before we get into Psalm 69, turn back to the book of Psalms and look at chapter 34. Psalm 34, I want to give you a few scriptures to kind of go along with our study tonight from uh, other passages. And uh, two of these are going to be from the book of Psalm. But look at Psalm 34 and down, look down at verse number 18, if you would, please. This is a very important verse, and if you've studied much about Psalms, you go to this verse probably quite often. I do. It says, the Lord is, say it with me, nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. Now look up if you would please. Once again, for the fact that uh, the Lord repeats this thought, not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New, it shows that, that a lot of people are going through life and they're, they're having a broken heart. And uh, what all that entails, I do not know, uh, physically or uh, medically speaking. And he goes on to say, and save us such as be of a contrite spirit. They kind of go together to deal with. When you and I come to the place that we realize, I can't deal with this. Now, listen to me very carefully. You sometime in your life are going to come to the place that you just feel like you're going to throw. The only thing you can do is throw up your hands and say, I quit. But don't do that. If you will use what the psalmist said here in this chapter, that he saveth such as of a contrite heart. Now the word saveth there has to do with deliverance. God can give you deliverance from that broken heart or that heaviness or that pressure that's bearing down upon your life if you will just simply, the word contrite uh, is uh, humbleness. Uh, if you lie down on your face in a contrite position, that means you're, you're literally putting yourself uh, to that position of humbleness. And that's what God wants us to do many times. He simply wants us to take and come to the place that realize we can't deal with the problem. We have to have someone who will sustain us, who will take care of the problem and lift the burden. And that's the reason uh, uh, Peter said there in 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 7, he says, casting all your care. Now that word care means whatever the problem, ever what the situation is, whatever the stress or the heaviness that you're bearing in your life, he says, cast it upon the Lord. Casting all your care upon the, uh, on the Lord, for he careth for you. Now, you're in the book of Psalms. Turn over to chapter 147. Psalm 147. And look at verse number 3. My pages are sticking together for some reason tonight. Look at verse 3. It says, he, let's say the next word there. Healeth. Now, uh, that means if you've gotten to that point where these pressures have literally been down on you, that they have caused even physical problems, emotionally and physically. He says, here's what I'm going to do for you. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. You see, that problem that's literally stabbing at your... Now, the heart here could be in reference to a physical heart as well as what we call the seed of the emotions. And we call it in the Bible the heart. Uh, the Lord uh, uh, says, for with a heart man believes in the rights. Now, we don't believe with this physical pump that pumps the blood through our bodies. We, it's that very decision maker, that seat of the emotions and decisions that we make in life is what we call the heart. And so David brings that very emphatically here and he says, look, he bindeth up their wounds. Now, I'm not going to have you raise your hand tonight, but do you have a wound in your emotions tonight? Do you have that heaviness so much on your life you just feel like you want to quit? Well, the Lord says, here's what you'll do. He says, just give it to me, and I'll bind it up. I'll, I'll take care of the wounds that are there in your life. And uh, I was reading this week, and surprisingly, medical researchers at Johns Hopkins University 
have now identified a medical condition called stress cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy. Also called broken heart syndrome. And the article went on to say this. This new research shows that tragic or shocking life events, including loss of a loved one, a car accident, armed robbery, a fierce argument. Boy, I didn't. That must be a pretty fierce thing. Fierce argument can cause a sudden surge in adrenaline that weakens heart muscles. According to the lead author of the John Hopkins study, made this statement. It looked like a heart attack in the sense that the EKGs were abnormal. The blood work was abnormal. But when you went to the lab, the arteries had no blockages. The patients had very few or more of the typical risk factors for heart disease. But the emotional pain they experienced had literally stunned their heart, making it feel like they were having classic heart attack symptoms. Now that's how much that you and I can be affected because of uh, a sudden uh, accident or a problem that might come up on our life and the stress that really uh, gets to our life. It went on to say, in some cases, broken heart syndrome can be as dangerous as a real heart attack. Although after treatment, most patients quickly recover. But in all cases, broken heart syndrome hurts just as much as a real heart attack. Research has also shown that the same regions of the brain that signal physical pain are also activated when we feel emotional pain such as grief or rejection. And that can be true. I found that to be true in the last 40 year, three years that I've been in the ministry that some people were so stricken by the loss of a loved one, it's as if they've had a heart attack. And uh, so we need that help from the Lord. I was also reading and studying uh, in regards to what really happened when Jesus died upon the cross. And Physically speaking, he didn't have a heart attack, but what happened was he died of a broken heart. Now, did he shed his blood? Yes. He went to the cross. But I want you to turn back to the book of John chapter 19, and I want to bring this into our study tonight. And if I don't get through with it, don't worry. We'll come back if the Lord tarries for another week. And I want to give you this right now because I want to show you how much you and I need to come to the Lord and cast our burden upon Him because there are situations, and by the way, this has not just in reference to older people, this is happening to young people today because of the stress and the strain that they're under. We call it peer pressure. And God wants us to know that we can have help. But look there at John chapter 19, and beginning down to verse number 28, it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And of course, this is a picture that we find there in the book of uh, Psalm, chapter 69, that we read the two verses, verse 19 and 20. It says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now watch this. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was in high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Now that was true because if their legs were broken, they would suffocate. They would fall down and literally they couldn't hold themselves up and they would suffocate. But that didn't happen to Jesus. Then came the soldiers and broke, broke the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear, read it with me, pierced his side, and forthwith came the blood and water. 
Now, I'm going to give it to you from a physician's viewpoint. Now, I'm not a physician. I'm going to give it to you what I, I studied. Maybe you've heard this before, and if you did, that's fine. But maybe it just kind of brings some remembrance back to you. But I want to give you this. It's commonly taught today that Jesus died of a broken heart. This idea was introduced by Dr. Stroud about the year of 1847 in the book on the psychological, psychological cause of the death of Christ. Let me stop for a minute. Yes. Is that the teens? Yes. I thought they already had it on. They let it go to sleep. Oh, they slept with it, huh? I don't know if I have another piece of paper to turn this on, on or not. What? Let me write it down on here. puts it in. And that's got to be a capital there, then all lowercase. All lowercase. Fourth. Okay. You got me on our Fred still? They, they still taping? Well, that's, <laughs> that's all right. Excuse us. All right. All right. Let me get back to what I was saying. Uh, a Dr. Stroud claimed that Christ died of laceration or rupture of the heart. This idea has since been per perpetuated by many Protestants today, and not only him, but also several doctors. A broken heart. What actually killed Jesus? Mississippi doctor says he knows by, and this was an article by Melanie B. Smith, on a big screen at East Highland Baptist Church in Hardisell, a hammer slammed into a nail, driving it into a man's wrist. The surreal clang of metal on metal rang out in the sanctuary. A multimedia presentation depicted the old familiar story of Jesus' crucifixion, which is remembered today on, on Good Friday. That was the illustration. But this material came with a physician's insight into the human body. Dr. David Ball said his research has convinced him what actually killed Jesus in a physical sense, and it wasn't suffocation, as was true for most victims of Roman's crucifixion. Uh, that's why they didn't break his legs. Uh, he, died, he died of a broken heart. And, and the reason they go on to say this, and I'm not going to read all this, but Ball asserts that Jesus died of a ruptured heart. Postmortem of Jesus. He said the gospel accounts from eyewitnesses give a sort of postmortem of Jesus' body. What gave us was irrefutable evidence of Jesus' death, the doctor said. For example, Matthew, Mark, and Luke report that Jesus shouted and died. Ball said it's impossible for anyone suffocating to shout. But someone suffering a rupture could sense doom and cry out, said the doctor. He said a victim of a bruised heart might be expected if he or she weren't on bed rest to exhibit further damage in four to six hours. That's the time span scriptures record, he said, that Jesus was on the cross. The doctor said a Roman soldier who was likely expert at crucifixion used a spear to ensure Jesus' death just as a captain of a firing squad in modern times fires a final bullet into a victim's head. Using a replica of such a spear, Ball showed how an upward thrust could puncture the heart John recorded that blood and water spilled out. And Ball said the description is important. It showed that Jesus' heart had already stopped beating. Blood from the rupture had filled the, the pericardium, as I pronounce it, the sac around the heart, he said. Blood naturally separates into red cells and serum as it sits. So the liquid looked like blood and water. Such a flow was so different from regular bleeding that John made specific reference to it, the doctor said. And then he goes on to talk more about this, uh, this part of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, that Jesus actually died of a broken heart. Now, you think about that a little bit, and you think about the fact that uh, they are on the cross, and before he went to the cross, the Bible tells us in John 1 and verse 11, he came into his own, and his own received him not. I mean, that would break your heart as it is, see. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus died of a broken heart. Uh, he shed his blood upon the cross, yes. But the fact of the matter is, they didn't put him to death. He died himself. No man took his life for him. He laid down his life Amen. for us, see. 
And so David talks about that a little bit here, if you turn back to Psalm 69. And I'm not going into all the details and everything, but our Christian faith is based on the reality of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and him laying down his life for us. So he died of a broken heart for you and me. All right, back here in chapter 69, there's some things I want to share with you about this matter of having a broken heart or having a heaviness upon us that uh, it brings such a strain upon our life. Look at verse number 19. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before thee. The first thing God wants us to understand when we're dealing with this uh, heaviness on our life or having a broken heart because of some circumstance, first of all, recognize what happened to Jesus. The word reproach here is very interesting. It means this. It means the expression of disapproval or disappointment. That would go right along with the scripture there of John chapter 1. Uh, when he came unto his own, his own received him not. Think about this. When he was on the cross, what happened to his disciples? They fled, didn't they? I mean, disappointment gripped him. These people who had seen the miracles of the Son of God, and yet they didn't believe Him. I imagine this. Let me go a little bit further. One of the individuals who was being crucified with Him railed on Him and didn't, wouldn't accept Him being the Son of God. The other one did, and of course, we know He went to paradise. He, that day was with the Lord. And so what disappointment here Jesus was doing for these people, and He was dying there on the cross, but this man didn't accept him. And how many people below the cross didn't believe it? But aren't you glad for the one soldier who said, this had to be the Son of God. This was, the son, this was the Son of God. What a blessing. And so you and I need to recognize what happened to Jesus. And his close friends forsook him. They denied him. They betrayed him. And what kind of friends is that? I don't know about you. I've had some friends that have turned away from me. Talking about having a heaviness. You know, how many of you ever had a friend that kind of turned their back on you? Raise your hand. How would you feel? Did you feel that emptiness and a heaviness in your life? Well, how, how the Lord must have felt when those that seemed to be so close to him and they saw what he did when he fed the 5,000 and the 4,000 and saw him raise people from the dead and, and saw him heal the blind and, and, and saw the lepers uh, healed and, and restored to health. And yet they rejected him. I mean, that would be a blow. Uh, for the people who laid down the palm leaves in, in that day when he came into the, to Jerusalem and they praised him and, and, and said hallelujah and, and so forth and so on. And then a little bit later they said crucify him, crucify him. Same people. How what a disappointment. And so that would break your heart and how Christ must have felt in the depths of his soul. And maybe that's why uh, Paul wrote there in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. He had to go through it in order to become our high priest. And he says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our, here's the word, infirmities. Now, infirmities doesn't mean just a sickness. It means all the pressures and the stresses and so forth that you and I uh, incur in our lives. Uh, that's what he's talking about. Uh, with the feeling of our infirmities, but was on all points tempted like as we, uh, as we are, yet without sin. And then in the same book, Hebrews 2.18 says, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, or the word means help, them that are tempted. So here in this thought of verse 19, it says, Thou hast known my reproach. You've known my disappointments. You, you, you feel that. And my shame. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that Jesus hung there in shame for you and me on the cross? Well, certainly. He did it for us. And then it says, in my dishonor, my adversaries are all before thee. And then he comes right back in verse 20 and uses the word reproach again. Reproach hath broken my heart. And I was talking about the Lord. 
and I'm full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. And then he says, let me tell you what they did for me. Instead of taking pity on me, here's what they did. They gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. I don't know about you. and I, I don't think it was apple cider vinegar either. I, I kind of like apple cider vinegar. I mean, some people don't like it. I, can just, I just throw it down. It don't bother me at all. But some people, my, my wife got bullshit. You know, has to hold your nose to take a little bit of it. But it doesn't bother me. But anyway, you think about that vinegar that burnt, and especially if you know much about vinegar on a hot day, uh, it just literally can cause bl uh, blisters. And that's what happened to our Lord. And we need to be encouraged when our heart is breaking because Jesus knows exactly what we're going through. Isn't that why it says, tell him all about your troubles? He will hear you and answer you by and by. The Lord knows all that we're going through in our lives, and that's why he invites us to, uh, you know, to cast our burden upon him, and he'll sustain us. And another thing we need to do, and it's in your outline, we need to ask him to lift the heavy burden. There's nothing wrong in the fact that when you and I go through the problems and difficulties of life, that we have somebody there that will carry our burden. I mean, that's why he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My, my, you know, we have the burdens of life, and he wants us to place them upon him. And so we need to ask him to take it. Matter of fact, Hebrews 4, 16, and you hear me quote the verse uh, over and over and over again. It says, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain uh, mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so he wants to bear our burdens with us, and he wants us to ask him. But wait a minute. Think of another thing here. Think also of the fact that it can be a time that you personally have the opportunity because of your problems and your burdens, and God leads you through them, and he takes care of the problems in your life. It's an opportunity for you and I to help bear somebody else's burdens. But Dan, doesn't the Bible say, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ? You see, when we go through a heavy time, when we go through a stressful time, when we've gone through these problems of life, God gives us the opportunity to help somebody else that's going through that time. Listen, when I'm going through a problem, I, I like it when somebody sits down and says, Bill Moore, I've gone through the same thing. I understand what you're going through. And God wants us to help other people. He wants us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the, uh, uh, the law of Christ. And then when we have had, uh, we've had a broken heart, it makes us usable to take pity on those that uh, maybe nobody cares about and, and uh, they need somebody else to kind of shoulder the thing with them. So God wants us to understand Jesus is there, and that's why God gave the, the psalmist here, David, the picture here in verses 19 down through verse number 21, what Jesus went through, and he understands what we're going through, and he wants to help us. He wants to bear up our burdens if we'll give them to him. But let me come a little bit further. Look at the next verse here. Matter of fact, we'll start back at verse 19 again because God wants us to share with him how we really feel. Uh, you know, we, we come to God sometimes and in prayer and we kind of hide what we really need. It's like a little kid coming in and they're going to ask their dad for something and they kind of hold back and, and they ought to just tell him what it's all about. And so David describes this back in verse number 19, of course, describing Jesus. Uh, he says, Thou hast known my reproach. Tell God about your reproach. Uh, tell him about the shame that you're going through. Uh, maybe somebody's disgraced your name. I mean, they've, made, they've put a blot on your name. I'm going to tell you something. Whether you know it or not, that will take and put an emotional strain on your life. And he says, in my dishonor, you've dishonored my name. Mine adversaries are all before thee. Uh, sometimes uh, we really don't know what people are going through in life. 
We don't understand sometimes the adversaries that they're facing. Like example, let me ask you a question. Do you think a person who is in financial difficulties that they don't have a great strain on their life? I want to tell you something. I've, I've counseled people that have gone through great strains, and it's worse than having a physical uh, problem. And the pressures that are under to get their bill paid. One day I had a lady come to my office, not here, in another ministry I was in, and she came to me and she says, Brother Moore, I absolutely don't know what we're going to do. She says, my husband usually comes home and he, she gives me the, he gives me the check and I distribute it and I buy the groceries and I pay the bills and so forth. And at that particular time, and I can tell you because, you know, the person you wouldn't know anyway, this is years ago. And he was making $400 a week. Well, back then, $400 a week was a lot of money. $400 a week isn't much today. And she says, Brother Moore, I don't know what I'm going to do. I says, what's the problem? She says, his check has been cut exactly in two. He's only able to bring $200 home a week. She says, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm in such a, a mess. And she was, I mean, she was talking about somebody was stressed out, Brother Dan. She was stressed out. I, I mean, she was so emotionally upset. Uh, I didn't know what I was going to do with her. And after she finished telling me the story, I says, okay, here's what I want you to do. This afternoon, and if you want me to help you, I'll be glad to help you. This afternoon, I want you to call every person that you are uh, that you owe money to, and I want to I want you to tell them your story as calm as you possibly can. And I want to ask you if you're if you're if you're paying you know like ten dollars a week on a debt, I said ask them if they'll take five dollars. She got back with me after she did that, and every person that she owed agreed with her. She was able to cut that thing and so she, Brother Dan, she was able to deal with the 200 because everything was cut right in half. And how much relieved she was. I mean, she came back, she was rejoicing in the Lord that God took things out. Folks, you can't rejoice in the Lord too much when the incident happens like that. But God took care of it. I had a man come to my office one day and he said, Brother Moore, I don't know what I'm going to do. He says, I've got myself in debt. Head over heels. And I didn't know things were going to go the way we were, and I just bought a new, uh, new vehicle and everything. And I, sa I said in my mind, I said, stupid, you should have checked this thing out, you know. But anyway, he, he told me, he says, but I don't know what we're going to do. I says, well, why don't we trust the Lord? Why don't we pray that God will work this thing out? And we did, and I explained some things, and I gave him some counsel on finances and so forth like that. And I asked him, I said, one of the questions I asked him, I says, are you tithing? He says, no, Brother Moore, I haven't because things have been really tight. I says, if you'll agree with God that you'll tithe, God will work things out for you. And he did. He made a commitment to the Lord that day. The next week he came back to me and says, Brother Moore, you won't believe this. He said, I got a raise and it helped me to catch up on my bills. Plus, it gave me more to spend. He says, boy, God really does things. I says, when we trust the Lord, he'll work things out for you. But the stress that can be on people in a financial area is overwhelming sometimes that they just don't know what to do. But I want to tell you something. Jesus is the answer. Amen. If you'll put Jesus first, you'll, you'll depend upon Him. God will work the situation out. So we need to identify the problem, and we find this down through verse 29. All right, let's just read the verses, and you'll see the problem here. And I think it's important to tell God exactly what your problem is. Don't, don't be half-hearted about the thing when you talk to God, but just tell Him what the problem is. Uh, begin verse number 22. Let them, uh, let them tab uh, table become, uh, excuse me, let their table become a, uh, uh, boy, I've got my Bible so marked up, i got that word marked over. Um, a shade before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened, that they see not, and make their, their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them, and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Now, he's, the, uh, David, of course, is speaking this, but he's also, this is in reference to what the Lord is doing to his enemies. It says, Pour out thine indignation upon them, and let thy wrathful anger take hold on the, of them. Let their habitation 
habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten, and they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them come unto thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous." But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. Now here David is actually telling his problems, but at the same time he's going forward in a prophetic sense talking about Jesus. And folks, God wants us just to get down to the nitty gritty. If you need something, if you have a problem, tell Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles, the song goes. Whatever the problem is that you're being confronted with, don't be reluctant to come right out and tell God what your problem is. I've told my kids, I says, listen, don't beat around the bush. Just tell me exactly what's going on in the situation. Don't hide anything from me. I remember one night, of course, we were always telling our kids to be careful when you're out driving and what you're doing. And, and uh, usually they get in trouble when they don't listen in the first place. And my son and daughter, they had gone to a, a little town not too far out of uh, the little town there of Lawrenceburg, Indiana. And they were down in there, and, and they should have been home at the right time. Uh, kids, if your parents get, and they should give you a, a curfew. They should. Anyway, I told my son, now, I said, I want you to home by 11 o'clock. I said, I didn't say 11.01, I said 11 o'clock. If you come in 10 seconds later, you're late, okay? Well, he didn't come in 11 o'clock. I got 12 o'clock, and I got a little bit, you know, uh, concerned about the situation. Well, number one, he shouldn't have been in the town where he was at the time because they had a curfew in the town. And so guess what happened? He got stopped by the police. Now, he didn't want to tell me that when he first came into the house. He just beat around the bush, see. But he got in trouble. Another time, he got in trouble too because he was out late once again. Hey, sure, he was on a date. And if he would have given me a call, because number one, he, listen, he should have left on time to get, get home at the right time, see. But a real bad situation happened then. He was driving home. He was up more than two minutes from the house. And some kids were playing this game where you, they try to dodge the cars and so forth like that. And one girl, he hit her. And it was her fault, really, but they didn't bring out that. So he had to go to court. And, you know, all these things happened. But he beat around the bush when he first came in about what had happened. He was so, you know, afraid of what was going to happen. I mean, he was in trouble as it was, you know, with the police. And then he comes home, and now Dad, he's going to be in trouble with Dad. Why? Because he's come in late, all right? You see, just tell God all about the problem, no matter. Yes, you're in trouble, but tell God about the problem anyway. Tell him the situation to the nth degree so he can deal with it, see? To make a long story short, uh, they did prove the little girl was at fault, and he didn't get in trouble. He didn't have to. We'd, the insurance company hadn't had to pay anything out or whatever it might be. And she had a lot of, you know, physical problems, you know, from the situation, but it was her fault. So tell God all about your problems. Deal with the situation. Don't hide anything from God, but identify the problem. Identify the fact of reproach. Identify the problem of shame. Identify the problem of dishonor. Identify the problem of your adversaries, your heaviness, and yeah, your pity party too. Okay. Just tell God all about it. Let me give you one more thing here that I want to share with you tonight. Found in verse 20. Look for someone who can help have pity and comfort for you. Don't hold it in to yourself. Yeah, I'll tell it to the Lord, but go to your Christian friends. You know, your Christian friends are the best people you can go to. Talk to them about it. Ask them to pray for you. They're there for that. That's the reason I gave you the verse earlier out of the book of Galatians there. It says, bear ye one another's burdens. See? God wants us to share our burdens with other Christians. That's why they're there. Hey, listen, Christians are the best friends you can have. See? And you can tell your problems to them. 
and you can, you can get some relief. Uh, I want you to take your Bible in closing tonight. Turn over to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now I want you to look there at verses 3 through 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I use these quite often when I'm, especially when I'm dealing with people who are going through the time of grief. And trying to share with them these verses has been a blessing uh, up through the years. But look there at verse number 3 if you would. It says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Now you remember mercies, folks, is something that God uh, withholds from us, though we deserve it. It's the opposite of grace, though mercy and grace go together, don't they? God withholds something from you and I that we deserve, and that is hell, or punishment, or, you know, some kind of discipline. And so he says, uh, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in what? All our tribulations. Doesn't matter what it is that we're going through. Why? I want you to look at verse 4 there very carefully, and here's why God wants us to uh, come to Him and get comforted. And the second part is that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. You see, when you go through problems, you're not to just think about yourself. You're to think about other people that are going through difficulties and situations. Always be on the outlook for other people who are hurting you see, Christians need to love people, no matter who they are and what they've done. God wants us to help people who are in trouble. God wants us to help the downtrodden, the, the, those who are cast down, those who are, uh, are having difficult times. Be ready to help that type of person. Lift them up. Encourage them. And uh, God will bless you for it. Now let me read the rest of the verse. By the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. You understand what he's saying there, folks? Let me illustrate, and I'll close. When I go to a funeral, I explain to people those verses, and I say, you know what? I'm here as a pastor today to give you consolation, to give you comfort through the Scriptures and encouragement, because you're going through a difficult time. You're going through the, 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 the principle of grief that's been bestowed upon you by the passion of a loved one. Matter of fact, last evening, I was in Fremont, Ohio. My son-in-law, his mother had passed away. And his brother and sisters came and said, we can't believe you drove all the way from New London, Ohio to come up here to show you your love and your concern for us. And I says, that's what Christians are supposed to do. We're to comfort one another. We're to be of help to people. And that's what God wants us to take and step into people's lives that we might have an effect upon their lives. You see, God has given us comfort. Don't hold that comfort back from somebody else, but have pity on them. That's what David is talking about here. And that's why we have Jesus. He understands what we go through, and He can pity us when we go through the difficulties of life. Let's bow our heads on a word of prayer. We thank You, Lord, for Your Word. We thank you, Lord, you understand about having a broken heart. And I imagine about everybody in this auditorium, maybe some of the young people, the younger ones, may not quite understand it. But we do because we have seen it in our own lives, and we've seen it in the lives of our loved ones and our friends and neighbors who have gone through difficult situations, not just the hour of grief, but uh, problems that they face with and troubles they've got themselves into. And we're to have pity upon them. We're to try to help them. And so, Lord, I pray that this lesson we've taught tonight, though we didn't get to finish all the lesson, 
I pray you take that which we gave and may it be a blessing and help and encouragement. And may we look for somebody that we can be an uplift to in this week. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.